Now, recently, somebody was asking me why it is that I love hosting on the Law & Crime Network, and there are just so many reasons, uh, much of which has to do with the true crime pieces to the stories that our people find. The room of folks back there, the producers and the camera people, they're just, the writers are unbelievable. And we find these fascinating trials across the country, and then we get to go gavel to gavel with those, really do a deep dive, not a one-minute hit, but we really get to have pros come on here, like my next guest uh, for the Law & Crime Network, and put on witness and, and bring people like Ed Bull on the show and really get into what it's like to be a trial lawyer in the real world of the real courtroom with real defendants and real victims. One of the next cases we got coming up that our crew picked, which is unbelievable, and a lot of them are tragic, but it's a great case, and it's going to bring out some really interesting legal issues. It's the John Johnchuk trial. He is charged with murdering his five-year-old baby girl, Phoebe. It's a really, really horrible case. Look at that little angel. I get goosebumps every time I have one of these cases that we lose such precious gifts like this. It's really sad. And that's what made me love being a homicide prosecutor myself. But anyway, she was thrown off the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, 62 feet to her death in the Tampa Bay. Um, obviously, this comes out of Florida. But the story in this trial is going to be about John, John Chuck and his mental competency. I mean, you take a look at the guy. He looks weird, twisted, and distorted just from the pictures themselves. And and for a certainty, insanity defense is what is being postulated in this particular trial. We have a very unique opportunity to speak to someone who has been following this case from stem to stern and will continue to do so for the rest of this trial. So I get yet another great guest to come on the show. Josh Solomon from the Tampa Bay Times is the reporter that knows this case inside and out. Josh, I know you're busy and there's a lot going on, but thank you for appearing on the Law and Crime Network. Hey, in, in your introduction, you, you mentioned that she, uh, Phoebe was dropped from the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. She was dropped 62 feet from the Dick Meisner Bridge, which is uh, uh, about a mile from the Sunshine Skyway on the on the northbound lead up. Uh, the, so I just wanted to make sure that, that that was correct. A lot of people, you know, uh, misconstrue those two details. But uh, but before we get started, I figured we'd start yeah, but, there. But there you go. There's why you're the expert, because I literally read that off an article that was provided to me. And so little details like that are important because, you know, you're there. You're watching it. You know all the details. So that's what makes you an amazing guest. Thank you uh, for that correction. So listen, give us a little bit about the backdrop of what led to this, because there was actually a police chase. And then I also want you, Josh, to get into the defendant's mental health history prior to the incident. Yeah, so the incident started, um, uh, it, it started late one night, uh, uh, right after midnight on January 8th, 2015. Um, there was a PT cruiser driven by the defendant, John Johnchuk, who was uh, heading toward the Sunshine Skyway Bridge from St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, south. And uh, he was speeding, and there was an off-duty police officer who uh, sort of started following him, uh, lights off, um, and was just observing to see, you know, what the, the driver of the PT Cruiser was going to do. Um, the driver ultimately pulled over on the side of the road at a bridge, uh, got out of the car, went to the back seat, and pulled his five-year-old daughter, Phoebe, out of the back seat. Um, the officer got out of his cruiser, had his gun drawn, a little unsure about what was going to happen, and before, you know, before he knew it, um, uh, John Johnchuk had dropped Phoebe off the bridge. Um, from that point forward, then there was a police chase uh, as John Chuck drove south into Manatee County towards Sarasota, and he was ultimately apprehended uh, uh, shortly thereafter. I'm, I'm curious, Josh, because we know an insanity defense, and we'll get to that second part of the question in a minute, yeah. is being opposed here, but um, conduct just before and just after is very relevant to a prosecutor with regard to showing what we call goal-oriented behavior. That is, that therefore he knew and could appreciate the rightfulness and wrongfulness of his actions. That's pretty much the standard definition of sanity or insanity. And flight from police would clearly be used by prosecutors to show consciousness that he knew that he was doing was wrong. Do we have any information about what he or what kind of state of mind he was in once he was eventually stopped by the police? So once he was stopped, he was he was very calm. Uh, he didn't he wasn't panicked at all. This is what officers said in their depositions. Um, he didn't he didn't follow directions, but he didn't disobey directions. He basically was just static. I mean, I you know I personally I don't know what that what that says about his his mental state at the uh, at the time of his apprehension. Um, uh, it's been well documented that he had some. 
uh, he, he was behaving radically uh, prior to uh, dropping Phoebe off the bridge. Uh, he carried earlier that day. He carried around this this enormous Swedish Bible, and uh, he was in a custody battle for Phoebe. And he asked the lawyer who was representing him in the custody battle uh, to start reading the Bible for, in Swedish. And of course, she can't read Swedish. Um, he he. There was some mention that he had been salting his home to try to rid the home of evil spirits. Um, so I think that's what the defense is going to try to lean on to say that his mental health was te deteriorating, you know, uh, before and until he, he dropped his daughter. Josh, we have reporting, and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong because you're the guy, but I have written down here that the day before his death, that his lawyer called the Division of uh, Child Services, I assume it is, saying that he's delusional, that the DCF did not investigate that, um, that he takes the daughter to three churches begging priests to exercise her. He wanted an exorcism. One of those priests yes. called the police when he came out from the data I'm getting. Um, the priest basically said, well, he's not a danger to himself or others, and the police let him go. Um, and that, that the, these, all things that were happening just before that incident, are those facts accurate? Yeah, pretty much. So he went to the, the lawyer's office that was going to file uh, some paperwork in his custody dispute over Phoebe uh, and again asked her to read this Bible in Swedish. Um, she can't read Swedish. Uh, he, she thought he was acting erratically, so she actually called both the Florida Department of Children and Families and the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. Uh, the city of Tampa is in Hillsborough County down here in Florida. Um, and, you know, DCF has a, has a pretty high and sp a specific threshold for, you know, activating uh, investigations, and they felt, based on her call, that, that there wasn't anything they could do. Um, they were hamstrung by their policy and their resources. Um, when he... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, when the lawyer called uh, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, two deputies met uh, John Chuck and his daughter at the church where the lawyer said he was going next. Uh, the two deputies interviewed him. Um, there's something in Florida called the Baker Act, which allows people to be taken into medical custody if they're uh, a threat to themselves or to others. Uh, but the deputies didn't feel that he met the uh, requirements for being Baker acted. And so there's really, I mean, as far as they were concerned, there was nothing they could do or no reason to take him into custody. Yeah. And so they, they let him continue on his day. Yeah, sad, sad, sad thing, because I also understand there have been numerous previous involuntary commitments for mental health issues. Um, whether or not police are, got that data, I don't know. But when you have a lawyer calling in and a priest telling you that somebody's acting delusional and he wants an exorcism for his kid, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Am I missing something as to why he wasn't brought in? Uh, you know, I, I think they, they try their best to follow guidelines. I, I really can't speak to, to that so much, but uh, it was the lawyer who called both uh, DCF, the Department of Children and Families, and the Sheriff's Office. Uh, the deputies met him at the church based on a call from the lawyer. I just want to make sure that point is accurate. It wasn't the priest uh, who called uh, 911, uh, as far as I know. Well, well uh, definitely in an article I read that it indicated a priest did call, but I guess we'll find that out during the course of the trial. Uh, Josh, listen, you've been a, an amazing resource. I hope you'll consider coming back and giving us more of your you know awesome knowledge of this case and your insights because uh, cases like this should be highlighted those little precious angels we need to do a better job josh don't you think you know uh, uh there were certainly some failures highlighted by our reporting and other people's reporting immediately after phoebe's death uh, there have been some policies and some regulations changed, um, and I think that's why reporting on these sort of instances, incidents is important to try to leave, uh, you know, avoid tragedy in the future. Right. Um, today, uh, opening statements, and uh, and we hope for some good testimony today. And so, uh, absolutely, ha have me back anytime. I'd love to. I'd love to come back. Josh Solomon from the Tampa Bay Times. Thank you so much, sir. We need to go to a break. We'll be right back.